All right, so we're going to get started now. Welcome to United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey here in Jenny Jump State Park. Um, this is the third to last? No, fourth to last. Uh, we're slowly counting down uh, the, our last of uh, the in-person presentations for this year. Uh, we are open on site in Jenny Jump State Forest in Hope, New Jersey uh, from April through October every Saturday and we give this presentation at 8 p.m. and then as long as the weather is cooperating which it has not done uh, t tonight nor the past uh, couple nights uh, we normally would have uh, observing through our telescopes and whatnot out on the field. Uh, so I want to welcome everyone. Uh, like I said, we do have an in-person audience and we also have an online audience. That's right, all of these programs are streamed online to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can either check them out live if you ever can't make it uh, because something else ha has caught your attention and the drives is just a little bit too much. Or, if uh, if you want, you can always check out our past presentations through there as well. So, a couple things that I'm going to go over for you guys who are here in person. Um, please, uh, if you are using lights to walk around, and it's uh, kind of dark without the moon tonight, uh, do keep them kind of pointed towards the ground. Uh, we like our eyeballs. I'm sure you appreciate the same sentiment. So we are going to keep our uh, lights pointed down when we can so that we don't blind people. That being said, when we go to leave, we are still using our headlights because we also like, as much as we like our eyeballs, we also like not getting physically run over by a car. Very important. Uh, as much as it... It is getting into Halloween and spooky season. We want to avoid have adding to the uh, spooky, scary skeletons dancing around. Uh, if you guys here need to use the bathroom, we have the porta potty to my right, your left, and we also have a sales desk uh, with a couple interesting uh, items uh, and a couple helpful ones like the planospheres and whatnot. So. Uh, while you're here, uh, like I said, we are hosting this online. You can check out all our of our offerings, our what telescopes and equipment, what uh, what our member clubs are through our website. That website is uacnj.org. Uh, like I said, you'll see all of those list of the presentations we have going. Uh, hopefully we'll have a list of our winter presentations go, going up soon uh, because we, even though we will not be in person anymore as the weather gets colder after uh, the last Saturday in October, we will still be uh, doing periodic presentations uh, solely on our YouTube until next April. So, with that being said, uh, do also check out our other face, uh, our other uh, social media. We have a Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, look forward to seeing more pictures of. I, I know a couple people have been sharing some at, astrophotography. Um, we also have a Discord server. So, like I said, all those links are available on our website as well. Uh, since we are a nonprofit, we want to thank you guys for coming out uh, because even though we do offer these for free, a lot of you guys have supported us greatly throughout uh, these years and have kept us actually going through your donations, uh, through your purchases, through the gift shop. And we want to thank you guys. Uh, for everyone who actually makes a minimum donation, we've been hanging them on our uh, door here on the uh, stars. So you can uh, check out the links to do that on our website as well, uh, where we also have a Patreon if you want to, which is more of a monthly subscription type thing, uh, where we have various rewards that you can check out there. 
All right, so with that being said, and it looks like most of the people here are actually settled in, uh, tonight's presentation is Asteroids and Their Moons with Alan Midkiff. Alan became interested in astronomy during junior high school, the same age he began flying a airplanes. He received a... Okay, Alan, you're going to have to help me with this. What's AS stand for? A s <laughs> I should have known that one, but I d apparently did not. He received an associate in aviation from Hawthorne College and a bachelor in electrical engineering from Lehigh University. He also has a, I'm assuming that's master's, MS, in aeronautics from MIT. After graduating MIT, he worked as a research engineer in an aeronautics lab for 25 years, only to take a break for one of those years to serve as a site manager for MIT's Wallace Astrophysical Observatory. He has been employed as a pilot for American Airlines for 35 years. His 24,000 flight hours range from Piper J3 Cubs to the Boeing 787, with numerous Airbuses and McDonnell Douglas types in between. He is currently a 787 captain operating overseas routes. In 2007, Alan co-founded the Northwest Jersey Amast Amateur Astronomers Club, where he still serves as president. The club meets at his farm in Northwest New Jersey, where he has two observatories housing a number of telescopes, including a newer 50-inch Newtonian. Recently, he has acquired a hilltop property in the dark sky area of New Mexico, which will serve as the future home of the 50-inch telescope and a 10-inch Zeiss refractor. And with that, Alan. Yeah, pressing the power button is very important. Uh, talking now. Okay. There you go. All right. Well, thank you for coming. We're going to talk about asteroids and their moons. So, just a little overview for the talk. We'll start out talking about the asteroid characteristics and then some of the research binary asteroids. And then I'll talk a little bit about our data collection and analysis we did in support of some uh, researchers uh, at MIT. Shield your mic a little bit because uh, okay. All right. So some asteroid basics. Uh, asteroids are defined as small bodies of the inner solar system that are not planets or comets. They're remnants uh, not large enough to become major planets, but a subcategory of minor planets. Uh, they usually include the inner orbit of the solar system out to Jupiter. The first discovered was Ceres in 1801, then Pallas and Vesta, and then so on and so forth. Uh, initially, they were called planets until about 1851, then Ceres was recategorized as a dwarf planet. Currently, there are over 800,000 known, but that number goes up every day with a lot of uh, asteroid survey programs, asteroid and comet survey programs. The Minor Planet Center in Cambridge is the clearinghouse for asteroid discoveries, and they use the observations to determine orbital elements. And this is just a scale drawing the size picture here with our moon, and that's Ceres, that's the largest asteroid, and then Vesta so it gives you an idea of the scale, the size of these objects. So Vesta was the smaller one in the last picture, and this shows you uh, as the asteroids get smaller, they tend to lose their spherical shape. Uh, and they, they can be uh, really almost any shape, um, and that'll come into some importance later on in the talk. So where are these things? The asteroids, the main asteroid belt is between Mars and Jupiter, and here you can see where Ceres and uh, Juno and Pallas are. Um, primary location of near-Earth asteroids are in the inner solar system inside Mars orbit, and there's a greater than 26,000 of these known. The Ateras are actually inside Earth's orbit. Uh, the Atens and the Apollos are uh, respectively inside moving out and outside moving in uh, across Earth orbit. And of course, they're a very high interest because of the threat that they, they pose uh, to the Earth collision-wise. And the Amors are outside Earth orbit. 
Uh, the main belt asteroids are between Mars and Jupiter, and there's greater than half a million of those known, and those are here. Okay, centaurs are between Jupiter and Neptune, and the Trojans uh, share Jupiter's orbit. You can see them here, uh, about 60 degrees behind and in front. It turns out a lot of planets have Trojan-type asteroids at these Lagrange points. There's just uh, more of them at Jupiter than any of the others. Uh, as you move further out, trans-Neptunian objects, or TNOs, they're past Neptune out to the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is about uh, a light year uh, out from the sun, and it's a source of a lot of comets, especially the non-periodic comets. Uh, the Oort cloud also includes uh, the Kuiper belt, uh, and uh, probably the most well-known Kuiper belt object is Pluto. About 80% of the minor planets are main belt asteroids or KBOs. And more recently, there have been interstellar objects that have visited our solar system. And they're on what's called hyperbolic orbits. And they just kind of swoop in, and then their speed is so high, they swoop back out again. And that was in, uh, those two were 2017, 2019. Now that they know to look for them, they expect to be, uh, to be more discoveries. So some characteristics of asteroids, uh, size-wise. Ceres is the largest at 590 miles, and it could be uh, any size smaller than that. Uh, most are smaller than uh, half a mile, uh, at least the NEAs and the MBAs. Uh, the minor planets, the TNOs and the KBOs, are much larger. Uh, the total mass of the main belt is about 4% of the Earth's moon, and Ceres makes up a third of that uh, 4%. So in terms of structure and strength, uh, they can range from loose rubble piles that are gravitationally bound to scattered rock, solid rock, and then uh, solid rock with chunks of metal. Composition-wise, there's three main groups, uh, carbon-rich, stony, metallic, and then the subcategories that are mixtures of those groups. Uh, and the percent of ice in these uh, bodies varies with distance from the sun, with more ice being further out. So what can you really see from a point of light? Uh, most instruments uh, uh, on the planet, really, when they see asteroids, are so small that they see them as points of light. There are some, like the Hubble can resolve some, and some of the larger instruments can, but most of the studies are done just by looking at these points of light. And this is a typical image of however many frames, four or five frames, and you can see as the, how the asteroid tracks across it. It can be played back as a movie. So uh, you can take the spectrum of these objects, uh, sunlight reflected from the asteroid can be used to determine its composition, and the, in the upper case, the spectrum is ma uh, matched to some kind of minerals uh, on the Earth, and the lower case is matched to a meteorite that was discovered. And this is the asteroid Apophis, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, about later. So the light is analyzed by comparing spectral signatures to, lo to known models. Uh, for determining size, uh, there's a number of ways to do it, but the brightness of an asteroid depends on the Sun asteroid distance, uh, the asteroid Earth distance. A little animation here. The asteroid size and the asteroid's reflection coefficient, which is also called its albedo, which correlates with the composition. So if you know where the asteroid is and you know its comp composition and you can measure how bright it is, you can infer and back calculate what the asteroid size is. The shadow transit method mentioned here is a, is a more direct way. And every now and then an asteroid will pass in front of a star and cause the star to blink out, kind of like a mini eclipse. And you can actually time how long the star is blinked out for. And if you have a number of observers along the predicted shadow path of where this uh, uh, the shadow path where the asteroid is going to cross, and you measure these different lengths of time, you can combine those measurements and create a cross-sectional shadow of the asteroid. It's actually pretty cool. You can get the whole outline of the thing, and then you can measure you know, the size directly from that. This is kind of predictable, uh, just a chart of the size versus population. As you can imagine, the larger uh, the asteroid is, or the larger asteroids there's fewer of, and uh, the smaller asteroids, there's a, a higher quantity of. Asteroids also rotate. Uh, nearly all of them do, just like almost any other body in the universe rotates in one way or another. Um, four to ten hours is a typical rotation period. Uh, the rotation is due to numerous effects, including uh, the conservation of momentum for when the asteroid was formed. Uh, could be due to a collision. Uh, this Europe effect, I'll talk about a little more. That's actually pretty interesting. It's the torque due to uneven heating and re-radiation from sun against different facets of a non-symmetrical asteroid. So I'm going to mention a couple times in this talk that most asteroids are shaped like potatoes or called potatoids. So when the sun hits them, it generally uh, will hit uh, or will reflect off of one side more than another. And because the uh, 
asteroids are not completely symmetric. That's important for us to know. So it's like a radiometer, which you've probably seen in science classes, uh, which when the sun hits them will spin up. So the rotation, uh, so the, this Europe effect was named for these four gentlemen here, whose names I'm not going to try to pronounce. Uh, the rotation period is due to the Europe effect. It's inversely proportional to the square of the mean distance from the sun. So obviously, the closer to the sun you are, the more the solar effect takes place. Uh, the KBOs, KBOs are pretty much too far out uh, for the Europe effect to be a factor. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, specifically about binary asteroids or asteroids that have moons. So Ida and Dactyl were the first discovered, which was uh, completed by the Galileo spacecraft in 1993. Ida is 35 miles long, and Dactyl, its little moon, we can see right here, is just about three quarters of a mile. So in the past 19 years, uh, approximately 200 more uh, binary asteroids have been discovered, uh, which includes 15% of the near-Earth asteroids, uh, and 15 to 20% of the main belt, 10 to 15% of the KBOs. Uh, and the revolution period of these, the, the time it takes for the small or one body to go around another is on average 10 to 20 hours. So how are these things discovered? Like, like uh, Ida and Dacta were discovered by space probes, but most of them are discovered through direct observing through uh, telescopes and ground radar. And this is just some examples. You can see here uh, an image, and this is the time exposure, so you can see the moon actually orbiting the main body. This is a Keck image, just uh, this is very pixelated, um, but it's an image of Patroclus. And this is actually an Arecibo, Arecibo radar image, uh, while Arecibo was obviously still in operation. So that's that's kind of cool. You can see the main body and the uh, the satellite. So how do these binary asteroids form? Um, so they could form by collision. Two asteroids collide. There's debris flung off some, but just floats off into space. Other is captured by the main body into an orbit. Uh, tidal disruption, where you have a rubble pile uh, that's loosely held together by gravity, and it passes by a larger body and gets pulled apart, but some of the components fall into orbit. Uh, or just almost the opposite, gravitational capture, where you have a smaller body captured by a larger body. The, this fissioning asteroid is very interesting. Uh, it's a rubble pile spun up by the Europe effect past its breaking point. So uh, as a Europe effect imposes itself on an asteroid, it could eventually spin up where the centrifugal force will overcome gravity and a piece could break off. And some will break off and just fly off into space, but others could actually uh, fall into orbit around, uh, around the rubble pile asteroid. So not all binary asteroids can be explained by the rotational, fi uh, rotational fission effect. Uh, the Europe effect is probably not efficient enough uh, up to large asteroids greater than 10 kilometers, and TNOs are pretty much figured to be too far out from the sun for Europe to take effect. So speaking about uh, spinning asteroids, there appears to be a, a spin barrier or a minimum time that asteroids uh, can spin or, or an upper rate, so to speak. So the lower boundary to the rotation period is about 2.2 hours. And you can see a level point here. Above that, you tend to fly apart, especially if the rubble piles. Uh, this, this counts for asteroids about uh, 0.15 kilometers in size. So most asteroids up to about 100 kilometers may be uh, aggregate bodies to held together by gravity, like we mentioned earlier, the rubble pile types. And this is just a little cartoon of how a rubble pile could be disrupted gravitationally and pulled apart. And we kind of have an example of this, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. This is a, uh, a comet, Shoemaker-Levy, that in the early 90s uh, was broken apart by Jupiter's gravity and eventually ended up plummeting into Jupiter, uh, and it was pretty spectacular. So where are these things? You know, uh, they're really they're they're all over. In this image here, uh, once again, I think it's a stack of three. Um, you can see a few of them. There's a, apparently there's five on here. I don't know where the others are, but there's a uh, there's one right here going by this bright star, and I think there's one in here going by these two, and uh, there's one up here somewhere. I can't see where it is, but uh, there's two more somewhere that people in other past talks have been able to able to find. So I'll talk a little about light curves because that's one of, one of the main ways that they study the uh, the, the structure and details of uh, asteroids. So, so we talked earlier about how asteroids have these potatoid shapes, and as they rotate, they present different facets to the Sun-Earth uh, angle. And the brightness, uh, or the brightness or photometry of the asteroid can be measured as a function of time. And if you plot that brightness versus time, you come up with uh, phases. And this just shows about eight nights worth of data uh, that's uh, phased on top of each other. So a lot of people don't know that light curves um, that uh, 
Asteroids also go through light curve phases, much like the moon. This, this research gets to be really interesting. So, you know, depending on the sun asteroid angle, what you see on the asteroid in terms of shadow effects will change. So you can see as the asteroid is at opposition, it's like the equivalent of a full moon, you'll see the asteroid fully illuminated minus some shadows here. But as the angle decreases here, uh, it, it tends to blink out. So the photometry during these phase changes provides information on optical and physical characteristics of the regolith on an asteroid surface, uh, the albedo and the roughness and porosity. The slope of the brightness decreases with the phase angle and increase may also provide information on characteristics. So I'll talk a little bit more about these uh, light curve phases and how they're used in shape modeling uh, a little bit later in the talk. So why do we really want to uh, study these things? What's our motivation? Um, so on a basic level, we want to increase our knowledge uh, of the origin of the solar system. Um, how planets were built, were they built from uh, the top down, which would just be, you know, a cloud forming together to create a body, or were they built from the bottom up, small particles uh, forming together gravitationally to create a larger body. Uh, and it would be useful to know what these uh, objects are made of in terms of possible future mining, and there might be some valuable um, minerals on them. Uh, to determine the structure and the density of these asteroids, you can use a rotation period and Newton's laws to calculate the mass and density. And the rubble piles tend to be about one gram per cubic centimeter, which is like water. Uh, and high density uh, rock light can be up to four grams per centimeter. I think the Earth is like 3.5 or somewhere in there. Um, in addition to determining asteroid characteristics and density could be important in a situation where an asteroid would collide with the Earth. We talked about those Earth-crossing asteroids or those near-Earth asteroids, which the count is up to 26,000 now. And it would also help in determining possible countermeasures, whether it could be a gravity tractor pull or, or setting off a nuke somewhere nearby the thing to try to push it. Um, and the information that we get from the study of them could fine tune what percentage are single body versus what percentage are multi body. And here's an example of an impact site in Quebec where it looks like it was a multi body and they, they hit pretty close to one another. So, is all this threats uh, and asteroid danger, is it real science or is it just uh, Hollywood screenplay? So, what do we really know? Well, a lot, a lot of stuff goes off the Earth every day from space. So in fact, 150 or 50 to 150 tons of it. And most of it are, you know, grains making up meteors and micrometeors, or dust making up micrometeors and some larger stuff. And then we have meteor showers. But quite a bit of stuff actually falls to the planet uh, on a daily basis. So, what can the bigger objects do? Well, up to a meter negligible influence, unless, of course, if it hits you, then it has a big influence. Um, up a hundred meter could destroy a big city. A kilometer uh, could be life extinction of a, a major geographical area uh, or dramatic changes in climate. And uh, on 10 kilometers is on the order of, of mass extinctions. So do we have any evidence that this has ever taken place? Evidence is for asteroid impacts or mass extinction or did the extinctions result from uh, asteroid impacts? And can these uh, occur in the present? Well, there are some bodies in the solar system that um, they don't have atmospheres and they don't have a lot of uh, tectonic activity. So their surfaces are preserved for eons. So they're kind of um, are record keepers of the kind of uh, collisions that have taken place over a long period of time. Mercury, the moon. Callisto is one of the moons of Jupiter, and you can see that they're covered with craters. Uh, the Earth is a little bit different because we have weather and uh, plate tectonics, and there's a lot of things changing, but there's still a number of examples. Uh, here's one in Canada, what is it, uh, 35 million years ago. Uh, Namibia, 3.5 million years ago, it's 2.3 kilometers, these craters. Uh, Australia, 1.2 kilometers, and this is a famous one here, the meteor crater in Arizona, 1.2 kilometers, 49,000 years ago, and that uh, you can go visit that. Um, and this one here is uh, in Bolivia, and that's uh, only 20,000 years. So there is some evidence that uh, there has been in recent years uh, some impacts on, on our planet. Uh, mass extinctions, yes, there's evidence for life that was on the Earth and that is no longer there through the fossil record, including the dinosaurs, and that's a biggie. Uh, back in 1980, a father and son team came up with a theory. They identified this iridium layer um, at about the 65 million year uh, sedimentary uh, point. And it turns out iridium is very common in asteroids. And they also discovered, uh, found some shock quartz 
that had undergone thermal stress in the same area. And the theory is that uh, an asteroid about 69 miles, 65 million years ago, might have caused mass extinction. And uh, I guess the smoking gun, so to speak, is uh, later on they discovered this Chicxulub impact crater in the Yucatan that time-wise seemed to work out with it. So more recently, we talked about Shoemaker-Levy. And uh, in July 1994, that uh, broke up and impacted Jupiter, 21 fragments of uh, one kilometer size. And uh, you could see, you didn't see so much the impacts. I don't know if this is a Hubble image or a Galileo image, um, but you could actually see the shadows, uh, the cinder shadows as they came around as Jupiter rotated, which it does about every 10 hours, 9, 10 hours or so. Uh, about 100 years ago, uh, the Tungasta event, and that was a little bit different because uh, they figured it was an airburst. Uh, an object about 50 meters in size blew up over an area in Siberia that was very unpopulated. It took them a few years to get out there, and when they did, they saw, they saw all these trees that had been blown uh, over in a radial fashion so they could come up with some kind of epicenter. And if that um, object had blown up they, over London, say, this would have been the destructive area, pretty much the heart of the city. Uh, more recent events, uh, in 2013, um, uh, DA-14 was an anticipated encounter. They knew the asteroid was coming. Uh, it was going to be close to Earth inside geosynchronous orbits at 17,200 miles. And what they didn't know, and that's depicted here, is that around the same time there was another object approaching us from the sun, so it went undetected. And you've probably seen a lot of YouTube videos on the Chelyabinsk meteor, an unanticipated encounter, 55 feet, 41,000 mile an hour entry speed. Uh, it airborne at an altitude of 14 and a half miles, uh, the equivalent of 25 Hiroshima atomic bombs. And the uh, shockwave resulted in 1,500 injuries and substantial property damage. And this is just a dash cam version. Like I said, there's plenty more of that. Uh, once again, about 100 years ago, uh, some encounters that people had with meteors. Here's in Scotland, uh, uh, one went through this person's house. Uh, a few decades ago in New York, this meteor smashed into the back of this car. Um, so what are the collision probabilities? Um, around one meter happens several times a year. Presumably most of them fall into the ocean just because of the geography of the Earth. A uh, hundred meter about once every 10,000 years. Five kilometers once every 10 million. And 10 kilometers about every 100 million years. And this graph kind of depicts that uh, impact energy versus probability. And it's a good thing the curve goes down like that, not up like that, or we probably wouldn't be around. Um, but obviously the higher energy ones occur less often, which once again is, is intuitive. Uh, a few years ago, this, somebody came up with this Torino scale, and it's kind of like the equivalent of a Richter scale, which weighs the probability of an asteroid hitting versus the energy destruction, which often has to do with the size and the speed of the asteroid. So these lower objects are uh, smaller objects that have lower chance of hitting the Earth, and the higher ones are, the medium, middle ones are uh, medium size, or they could be high, uh, larger objects with low probability, or vice versa. And down here in the red, they're large objects with high energy, with high probability. And so far, this asteroid Apophis has topped the scale at a 4, and that had a collision probability of 1 in 37. But since they've redone calculations and they realize that Apophis is not a problem, at least on this next orbit. If it goes to its next orbit and it shifts again, they'll have to do the recalculation. So more and more asteroids are being discovered all the time. Uh, most of them now are through robotic surveys. Uh, and when Vera Rubin comes online, a very large telescope uh, in South America that's going to be dedicated just to look for these transient objects, there's going to be quite a few more discoveries. This is a kind of a dated slide about near-Earth asteroids, but you can see how, you know, in the past few years, it's kind of almost exponential in how uh, much more, how many more discoveries there's been. This only goes up to 2011, but like I said earlier, currently NEAs are over 26,000. So what can you do if one of these things is coming at you? Can you just go and blow it up like Bruce Willis, or, or what's the effect? And it turns out that, you know, if uh, if you blow something up, the, really the total energy level will be the same. You just have more particles that and objects that are coming towards the planet. And it's kind of like uh, the sorcerer's uh, apprentice effect. It's just uh, it's hard to create a controlled explosion and the conservation of energy is preserved. So here's some possible mitigations. You could attach an engine to it. You could do explosion, explosion recoil. That is, set something up next to it. If you can, get somebody out there and take it apart. Uh, photon momentum is just firing a laser at it. A 
gravity tug would, this is an example, I think, a gravity tug. We just park something next to it, and hopefully the, the slight gravity will pull it out. Uh, intentional warp is interesting. That would involve actually painting the thing so that one part of it got deflected by the sun and perhaps the boot would spin off. But these are all very low path corrections. In order to do any of these things, you have to detect the asteroid way, way out where the slightest change in orbit would cause it to mix, uh, miss the target Earth. So I'll talk a little bit now about uh, our data collection efforts, our collaboration with, uh, with MIT. And there were really, really two programs going on that we were involved in. Uh, the one applicable tonight was the binary asteroid measurements, and we also did some shape modeling. And I'll show you a couple of that, but mostly it's about binary asteroids. So we talked earlier about light curves, and light curves are uh, an asteroid rotation results in a variation of apparent brightness with time, typically three to five hour period. And here's another example of a light curve. Uh, they can be analyzed to determine the size and shape of asteroids and the presence of any satellites. The curve shape and patterns represent calculable volumes and surface geometries, and we're back to the whole rotating potato scenario. So here, this is a shot of another Ida. Uh, this is Ida again, and it's light curve as a binary. Uh, Luxembourg is data that we took, and you'll see a paper later on in the talk. Um, and Luxembourg was used in shape modeling. So Steve Sliven does a lot of research on determining rotational axes but he also uh, does shape modeling. And what's pretty neat about that is that um, if you can use those, uh, that phase shifting and take data of an asteroid over a three or four month period, different facets will reflect the sunlight. And now we can put these into software and back calculate the shapes of them and actually uh, come up with these models. And to take it to one step further, you can take these models and put them into 3D printers and actually print these asteroid models out and put them on your desk as paperweights and whatever. So it's, uh, it's pretty neat what they've come up with. So light curve photometry and phase monitoring taxonomy measure uh, the physical and optical properties of main belt asteroids and uh, near Earth asteroids. Uh, from differences between these two groups, physical process and mechanisms acting on asteroids can be deduced. So three types of light curves are features that are common among binary asteroids. And for any of these light curves to work, the satellite or the moon of the asteroid really has to be lined up with the main body so that it passes in front of or behind it. If you're looking at like 90 degrees from the top and it's just going this way, there's not going to be really any change in light. It really has to go around this way. And to complicate matters, um, the moon itself could be rotating too and present different facets. So that light can vary also, although it'll be a much smaller component. So the deep V-shaped minima uh, and the wide inverted U-shaped maxima are telltale signs of a binary asteroid. And then the deep V-shaped minima represents mutual eclipse or occultation between the primary and the secondary components. So you normally don't see these kind of Vs in regular asteroids. They, they will show up uh, in binary asteroids. So where, we did do, where did we do this research? Just about four miles north of here on my farm uh, in Blairstown. And uh, this is the observatory out in the middle of one of my hay fields uh, at 750 feet elevation. Uh, at the time, we used this 25-inch uh, reflecting telescope. Here's a picture of it here. Since then, the telescope has actually been donated to this organization, and someday will appear around the corner here. And someday, we hope soon. Um, but the observatory first has to get built. The telescope has an alt azimuth mount, which moves, means it moves up, down, and left, and right. And the pointing and tracking are fully computerized. I used an Optech image derotator, which did a number of things for me. It, I was able to keep the, uh, the uh, north up image orientation, which helped later on during the processing. And also, with this kind of mount, you get what's called field rotation as the object tracks a target across the sky, and the derotator can compensate for that. I also used uh, uh, an auto guider, and the auto guider is used to move tracking errors. So even though the telescope tracks on the object, you can use an auto guider to pick the target in the field, and the auto guider will keep that target uh, at its exact location. Make minor corrections into the drive system of the telescope to keep it tracking correctly. Some other uh, components, we use this program called the SkyX. It's a mapping program, and it interfaces with the control system. It has a database of objects, a lot of stars, but it also does have asteroids. For the asteroids that were not in the database, we just used the coordinates that were given to us by the researchers. Uh, this picture shows an older control system, TCS, Telescope Control System, it's DOS-based. We eventually substituted that with this sidereal technology control system, and that controls the drive motors, uh, which are all DC servos, and they also use encoders in the motors for feedback and on the telescope itself to keep the pointing precise. 
And uh, one of our members who's actually here helping set up and stuff, Chris Cowley, he networked the property so that eventually we could control all this stuff from inside our living room so we didn't have to sit out there in the cold weather while we were taking, uh, taking data. In terms of a camera, this is an older model, SBIG, uh, ST8 MXC. We bought it from one of the member clubs of uh, UAC and J. Uh, we didn't really need it for pretty pictures. We just needed it for measuring uh, how the brightness of the asteroids or the targets changed on the images over time. One thing that was important is we could set the, uh, set the cooler set point to one number and consistently maintain that so the images uh, were consistently taken at a, uh, the same temperature as far as the camera was concerned. Imaging software, we use a program called MaxD, Maxim DL5. It's very popular. Initially, we used what was issued by MIT. Eventually, we purchased our own. Uh, it outputs a file, a file format called FITS. Uh, it's a standard astronomy format. Uh, it's uncompressed. But the important thing for us is that it has a data header on it that uh, records the date and time of the exposure. The exposure time itself, uh, the CCD temperature, which we, I told you had to be kept constant, and also the type of image, whether it was a calibration image or whether it was an image that was used for data. And that information was used uh, further on for reduction, uh, reduction analysis to determine the light curves. Uh, so I'm not going to go over this a whole lot. Our data collection process involved a lot of calibration frames that compensated for um, uh, different things in the light path uh, that would cause um, uh, anomalies. Uh, also, uh, bias, and bark, uh, bias and dark frames, which compensate for uh, issues on the chip and normalize that. Um, and uh, once again, uh, we try to keep the chips as cool as possible to mitigate some of those effects. We used a program called MPO Canopus uh, for doing our analysis and our light curve generation. Uh, MPO Canopus would take the raw data and do the calibrations from the calibration frames. Uh, and it would also uh, do the light curve analysis through what's called aperture photometry, which is a little bit different. It's not like the aperture on a telescope. You can see the example down here. Uh, here's a target of some kind, and these are two different apertures. So what the program would do, it would measure the brightness of this and subtract the background brightness, just in case the background was different on different parts of the field, uh, of this uh, example image. So here's a typical frame off of a sequence which, which might have total eight or 900 for a given night's worth of data. And that eight or 900 is counted on this uh, image list here. So what you do for aperture photometry is you select your target. This was our asteroid. You select a comp star, and then, or more than one. You could do more than one comp star, and then you could select a check star. So what happens is uh, the software compares the brightness between these two stars from image to image to image. And the, what the check stars use is to make sure this is not a variable star. If it's a variable star, then everything goes kind of haywire. So this keeps this checks to make sure that's honest, and this is used to check the, how the brightness of this is changing. And since the, each image has a timestamp, you can change, you can measure the brightness of this change over time, and then you plot a light curve. So the target brightness is analyzed with a comparison star and checked uh, the star in each frame. Continuous consecutive one minute exposures plus a download time. Total sequence generates a bright, uh, plot of brightness versus time or a light curve. And these light curves are checked for quality and consistency before we would send them on to MIT. And what we would do is we would send the process data to MIT and we'd send all the raw data also, just in case they want to do all this stuff themselves. So the MIT team analyzes the light curves for additional satellite components, and our data and light curves are used in conjunction with other researchers and uh, data collection efforts to contribute to the binary asteroid research. So this is that same image of uh, Ida, and here's a light curve, uh, not one that we contribute any, any data to. So minimal data is available on binary asteroid, uh, binary components, which is the motivation for the MIT study. The MIT researcher uses special software that combines our data with seven or eight other contributors in order to create 15 to 30 hour light curves that capture the longer periods of potential satellites. So this is an example of a light curve uh, of a 15, with a 15 hour period binary. And you can see the deep Vs in place here. And I don't know that we contributed to this light curve or not. Once we sent the data off, we kind of just moved off to the next target. So this shows our first real effort. It's kind of noisy data, uh, 9620 Edward Olson, uh, 2.7 miles in diameter. It's a main belt asteroid, not real dim, 15th magnitude. 
Uh, we measured the period at 3.12 in the published, uh, 3.12 hours and the published was 3.8 hours for our first try. Wasn't too bad. You can see we got better at it. This is Barbarossa, it cleaned up quite a bit. Over three nights, we measured a period of 3.2 hours. You can see the data is nice and tight. There's a possible V in there. Whether the research found that that's to be due to a, uh, a binary asteroid, uh, I'm not sure. We didn't get feedback on that. And finally, uh, we had talked about um, uh, Luxembourg. So Luxembourg was part of the shape modeling program. Uh, this was an asteroid. We took uh, five nights of data. It was very tight. They're very high quality nights. We measured a period of 3.58 hours on it. Um, this had been unpublished, so we actually published this uh, in the Minor Planet Journal in April of 2014. Um, so I'm going to, before we take questions, I'm going to leave you with uh, kind of a fun video. So when you take images of asteroids, at least our setup, the field of view of these frames is about 11 arc minutes. And that number might not mean anything to you, but it's about a third of the size of the full moon. And a typical asteroid at its distance um, on a given night, five, five or six hours worth of data, will cover about half of that. So about an arc minute per hour. So you generally can put the telescope in one spot in the sky, it'll track across the sky, the asteroid will go across, and you can take your data off of using that MPO Canopus program. So we knew that there was going to be a close flyby of an asteroid. We, it was too close for us to get any real data on it, but we thought we would have some fun on it. So this QE2 flew by the Earth uh, very close on June 6, 2013. It was only 3.6 million miles. So being so close, it was going to span multiple fields of view. So what we did, just for fun, is instead of putting the guide camera on a star and letting the asteroid track across it, we actually put the guide camera on the asteroid and let the star field flow behind it. And it all looks pretty good. You can see this thing shooting through space. But uh, what we didn't anticipate is that two-thirds of the way through, the guide camera's tracking on the asteroid without any problem, but the, um, the asteroid passed in front of a star. So the guide camera got confused and reacquired the star, and the asteroid goes shooting off the side of the field of view. So I'll play the loop twice, and you can uh, you can kind of see it. It's kind of funny. And it takes a while for it to spool up. So here's our asteroid. You can see the star field. So this thing is moving across space, and uh, the guide camera, the guide is doing a good job. The auto guider is doing a good job staying on it. And it's passing by a bunch of stars. But uh, and it was moving pretty pretty fast. I mean, it just these these pictures. Uh, I, I'm not sure what I combined on them, but um, it was moving through a field of view probably in just a matter of an hour. So you can see here, it's going to hit this star, and the camera is going to get confused, and it starts tracking on the star and lets the asteroid go off the field of view. So I'll let it run one more time, and then we we can wrap it up. Kind of like pool ball physics there. What's that? Kind of like pool ball physics. Yeah, there. yeah. It looks like it looks like pool ball. No, it looks like it's seized up. But uh, anyway, that's the uh, that was our QE two. So um, that's the talk. Any questions? All uh, right. I want to thank you, Alan, for a great presentation. Uh, we are taking questions. Uh, how is this it's going to work is I've been monitoring chat uh, through my handy dandy uh, electronic devices and I'm sure you guys also have questions. I'm going to ask that when you have questions you raise your hand so I can bring you the mic out uh, because chances are if you have a question uh, our online audience also has a, the same question or a similar question. So to start us off uh, I have actually uh, one question. Uh, if you ever got a chance to take a trip to the moon or Mars, would you take it? To moon or Mars? Yeah. Sure, at least the moon. <laughs> uh, they'd have to get the radiation under control for me to go to Mars. All right. Oh, and now we're going to do limbo to get out here. <laughs> uh, you said there was a, like a two-hour... Uh, limit of the rotation of the rubble pile asteroids. What's the the the, fa the fastest of the non rubble pile rotation? I think you know the data never came up. I was always interested in the same thing. You know, just how like the solid chunky rock ones. Yeah, that never that never came up. They they apparently in that plot it just consisted of rubble pile rubble pile. No. All right. 
so our next uh, question online had to do with now you you're an amateur astronomer correct uh, how much do amateur astronomers contribute to gathering data on these objects would it be fair to say a lot is known because of amateur astronomers versus professional astronomers um, I would say yes a lot um, although in recent years um, there's been a lot of sky survey programs like the Catalina Sky Survey and these programs are completely automated and they are discovering uh, like a half a dozen to a dozen of these every night um, so yes there still are amateur discoveries and you can discover one and you can name it anything you want asteroids when you discover you can put any name almost any name Unlike when comets are discovered, you get your own name on an asteroid, you can put any name on it you want. But once Vera Rubin comes online, that's really going to scoop a lot of these uh, discoveries. As long as Starlink doesn't confound it too bad. <laughs> All right. Was there another question from our audience here? Oh, we got one. A more uh, generic question for you, maybe uh, uh, your personal opinion about it. I know astronomy is more um, inclined to see the world from the materialistic point. Do you know any um, astronomer uh, that uh, believes in a, a higher power, specifically in God? Um, yeah, actually, I don't know personally, but you can. The Vatican astronomers. The Vatican has its own entire observatory. Uh, that goes that goes way back. Yeah, they have an observatory out on Mount Graham by the Large Binocular Telescope, and I think they even have more. I think that's their main one now. But uh, yeah, I can't remember Guy Cosmologia. I can't remember his name. But yeah, there are a number of them that merge both faith and science. Yes. Yeah, I although I, I have an addition to that because I used to go to a private Catholic school, and uh, although one of my teachers there was not an astronomer uh, he, he had a firm belief in science and his his point of view is science does not necessarily negate religion nor does religion negate science one can fully believe that and he believes that you can fully believe in science and still believe that God made that science work and he had a much more elegant way to say it but, but the beauty of the universe does not is not taken away by scientific fact it just adds to your understanding of it i don't know if that helps <laughs> all right so the next online question uh you had mentioned iridium and shock quartz. Is there any uses for those types of materials? Uh, I don't know. You'd have to ask uh, the geologist. Uh, I, I just this came up as part of the talk. Is there evidence at that particular level of the uh, impact? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. You can make a shocked quartz telescope mirror, but I don't know if it would be any better than a regular quartz telescope mirror. Wouldn't know, and I'm sure there's a plenty of websites on uh, and various material science uh, programs wanting to test all sorts of materials like that. All right, is there another question from our audience here? I hear crickets. Uh, mainly because we're outside, but uh, let's see. Oh, hold on. So I know you mentioned there's a lot of study going on on the asteroids and their movements, right? So you also showed us the crater, uh, the meteorite crater damages that has occurred, occurred on Earth. One of the I think was that Arizona one that you showed. So um, is there any study that is going on that any asteroid is going to approach us any time, like next thousands of years or anything? And are we planning to avoid it, or do we know anything about that? Um, Apophis was the uh, as far as I can remember, I haven't looked into it recently, but that was like the highest level candidate. And they determined that that one is not. So right now, I don't think there's any that are on the horizon. 
But what happens is that, like Apophis was, I, I took some of the slides out because I didn't want this to get too, get too long. But there was a whole section on there about Apophis was going to go. And if it goes through this certain keyhole in whatever 2036, it could shift enough where the threat could get higher. So a lot of this stuff is, is mostly calculable, but it's not 100% calculable because of certain uncertainties. And the uncertainties can magnify. Um, so to answer your question, no, I don't think there's anything on the horizon. Otherwise, you'd probably hear about it more so than just a talk here. Uh, but Apophis, I think, was was the biggie for a while there. All right. Uh, let me get to an online question first. Uh, someone had asked a question about astrophotography. Why is taking pictures at the same temperature important? Uh, they noticed you had the uh, cooling on the camera and whatnot. So um, the set point is important because uh, it creates an even amount of background noise. So when you take your calibration frames, they're taken at a certain temperature. So when you, when you use your calibration frames to correct your data frames, you want them all to be at the same temperature. I, I think there was a second part to her question uh, that she was asking about, is there currently studies going on? And yes, there's a lot of studies uh, tracking these asteroids for, the, for these purposes. So yes, there is a lot of data being collected uh, for that purpose. A lot of organizations doing doing the studies, part of which is why the Vera Rubin telescope is going to be doing all these all these studies. That's a billion dollar telescope down in South America that's, that's going to be one of its primary missions. And just at the Catalina Sky Survey, because how do you get the first part of your question on the second part? The Catalina Sky Survey, if you look that one up, that's one, of the, that's one of the larger ones. There's a couple like that, but they tend to be uh, automated and robotic. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. I'm just putting out a last call for questions from our online audience. Is there any more questions from our audience here? Oh, hold on. Hi. Um, you mentioned, if I, if I remember correctly, that you measured the brightness of uh, the asteroid at any given time in comparison to a star uh, as a reference point. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, how that works? So um, when the light hits the chip, okay, the, the chip is, is sensitive to the photons coming in. So it creates what's called an ADU. And Mark can tell you what that stands for, something data unit. Whatever it's, but anyway, the number of counts on a given pixel is proportional to how many photons hit it. And that's really the number that you're looking for. So the stars will produce a certain count, and the asteroid will pursue, produce a certain count. So when you look inside that circle, that aperture, you're, you're integrating or counting all the, uh, the counts per pixel and then the total number of pixels. So that gives you a total brightness inside that aperture. And then you do the same thing for the asteroid. So you're going to get two different numbers in there. What you're interested in is the difference. You're interested in how that asteroid changes in brightness, because this one should, in theory, stay the same, but this count is going to be different. So from image, as you go from image to image, you're interested in how the count for the target changes versus the count for the comp star, which you hope is, is consistent. So if you take that number, and, and for each frame, which has a timestamp on it, that timestamp will have a count. So the timestamp becomes the x-axis, and the count becomes the y-axis, and that's how you plot the curve. So you're really just measuring the total energy within that circle. And like I said, the second donut, because there is some background noise, you know, you notice it's not completely black in the back. The second donut is to measure the background in that immediate area, and that gets subtracted out from the count that's inside the inner circle. And that's what all that's what aperture photometry is all about. Yeah. Uh, oh, I got another uh, good question from our online audience. Uh, are there any asteroids which would be easy to locate with binoculars or a smaller telescope? Yes. The, the first ones I put up there. So asteroids, um, they tend to have, uh, I don't know if you noticed in some of that, they have a number and then a name. They don't all have names, but they all have numbers. So that number tends to be, or not tends to be, but that number is in order of discovery. So usually the lower numbered asteroids tend to be the brighter. It's not completely true, but I'm basically true. So one series, you know, two best of four best of all goes across. Any with a lower number is probably easier to see. And in Sky Telescope Astronomy, you see the plot, some of those brighter ones, especially series, I think, with the 
the magazine every month if it's out. Um, but yeah, some of the, the, the brighter ones are, are definitely binocular objects. All right. Were there any more questions? All right. Well, I'm just waiting a couple more uh, seconds for any last minute stragglers in our online chat because uh, online chat, there is a slight d delay between what we say and uh, by the time they hear it. A uh, couple things to note, uh, like I said, do check out our gift shop. Uh, right now, I believe we have, it looks like we have maybe an observatory open down there to the left. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as the sky is exceedingly clouded over, uh, just another reminder, please use your headlights when leaving. Uh, also check out our website because you will be able to uh, look at uh, our last couple in-person uh, presentations will be listed there. I know uh, I'm excited for the Halloween one. Or, yeah, that's on the 30th. I believe it, it things that go bump in the night or something, yeah. something yep. like that. Sean Post just signed up for it. All right. So it looks like the questions are ended. Uh, I will have, since the sky is less than ideal, uh, once uh, the presentation ends, there will actually be a slideshow of images we've taken from previous nights where the sky has actually cooperated since uh, it is not the greatest night to be opening a telescope. I want to thank everyone for uh, sticking with us. Like I said, check us out on our website, our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we have the Discord chat server. And have a good night. And thank you, Alan, for a great presentation. And thank you guys for watching. Thank you.